fresh in the session. My name is Dirk Fahlmann. I am from Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Uh, this is second session is on process discovery, um, which is a bit of a more classical topic, but we'll see some new twists uh, to this topic today. Um, and what I like about this session is that we're discussing uh, two uh, process mining algorithms which have been researched heavily in the last two years. The first talk will be given by Adriano Augusto, who is uh, joining us from Australia. Hi, Adriano. Good to see hey. you. Um, and uh, Adriano and the team in Melbourne and uh, in Upper Moor, they were very proud of their split miner. And Adriano, you've been working on an improvement of the split miner. Um, and you're going to tell us, uh, I hope, a lot of new things about this. So the floor is yours. Um, yes, thanks for the introduction, Dirk. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Adriano Augusto from the University of Melbourne. And today I will give uh, an overview of the approach we designed to discover uh, true concurrency inclusive choices uh, within split mine. So um, if we were to look at the problem of automated process discovery, the problem consists in uh, discovering a graphical representation of the behavior of the process that uh, is recorded in an event log, basically in the collection of the process execution data. Now, if we have a look at the state of the art of automated process discovery, there's been uh, really a lot of studies in the past years, uh, uh, but the most of this uh, automated process discovery algorithm uh, consider to have into an input a very simple event log, basically an event log that has uh, three attributes only. A case ID that identifies the process execution, the activity within the process execution uh, that has been executed, and the timestamp associated to the activity completion. However, event logs can have uh, many more uh, attributes, and one of the most common attributes relates to the life cycle of the activity. Now, a life cycle basically uh, captures how the activity is executed, basically, it's its life cycle and uh, can have uh, several different uh, uh, events, sub-events uh, of the activity. But in this case, we consider, in the, in the case of this study, we consider only life cycles containing two uh, sub-events that are the start the event of the activity and then the event of the activity. And in this case, the timestamp relates exactly to that sub-event of the activity. So not just to the completion of the activity, but also the start of the activity. Now, what's the main difference between an event that contains life cycle and an event that doesn't contain life cycle? And even what change if we take into account life cycle and if we don't take that? Well, let's imagine we can observe in an event of life cycle that a certain activity span uh, between a start and an end time, and another activity B overlaps with the life cycle of uh, the previous activity A. So in this case, if we have a look at what, would, what we would observe in an event log with our life cycle, we would simply observe that uh, A completed before B, and B followed the, the, the completion of B followed the completion of A. And similarly, if uh, we uh, invert, so first we start B, and then we start A, and then first we complete B, and then we complete A, we would observe that uh, uh, first B was complete, and then A was complete. Now, so far, so good, but if we consider now another example where the life cycle of activity A and activity B don't overlap, so basically activity A starts and complete before activity B starts and complete, in the case of the non-life cycle event log, we would observe exactly the same thing that you observed in the first case. So again, you observe the A completed before B and then B completed before after A. And something similar will happen in the other case when B completes before A. So what's the difference here? The difference here is that whenever we have life cycle or record an event log, we are able to discover true concurrency. So we are able to identify which activities are executed concurrently in real time. Uh, while uh, without event logs, uh, we are forced to assume that two activities uh, are concurrent if we observe an interleaving. Now, interleaving doesn't mean that uh, we don't have concurrency, because in the first case, we have interleaving. In the case uh, above, we have interleaving, and we actually have also true concurrency. But in the second case, uh, we have interleaving while we don't have true concurrency. Now, some of the past studies uh, have focused on analyzing event data, 
that contains life cycle. Uh, most of them focus on process discovery, while one of the most recent study focused also in exploiting this uh, life cycle data to uh, model uh, performance models of the process using temporal network representation. However, looking at the results and the adaptation of the, these studies proposed, we couldn't find anything that could be reused as CIS in the context split mind. So we decided to design something uh, for split mire to improve it. Split mire is based on five steps, um, each of them including uh, uh, specific algorithms. Um, and uh, in this study, we redesigned the three of these steps. The first one, we redesigned the way we generated directly for low graph. The second one, we redesigned the way we uh, de discover concurrency between activities. And finally, in the last step, introduce an heuristic to discover all splits and to remove improper completion. Now, if we have a look at the split miner, the original split miner, if we consider this event log, uh, split miner would just uh, observe um, something like this. So basically, is is split miner is completely unaware of start and end uh, events of each activity. And this entails that once split miner generated a full graph, it would uh, grossly uh, generalized. So it would be very imprecise, the directly follow graph. Uh, for example, in this case, it will discover a lot of uh, short uh, self loops while they're actually not there. So we uh, redesigned this step by um, redefining uh, what's a directly follow relation. A directly follow relation for split minor 2.0 is odds between an activity A and B if we observe the activity B start event after the activity uh, A end event, and no other uh, activity and event is observed in between. So if we assume this uh, definition uh, as a directly follow relation, and we calculate the directly follow graph, uh, we obtain a much leaner and simpler directly follow graph. So basically no more uh, self loops and no more short loops between activities that are actually concurrent. Um, so this was the first uh, uh, um, change in split mire. Uh, the second change relates to how we consider concurrence between activities. In the original split mire, two activities are concurrent A and B if a few relations hold. So first of all, we must observe a directly follow relation between A and B and between B and A. Uh, a and B must not be in uh, short loops, so we don't have to observe in the event log patterns of the type ABA or BAB. And then uh, this heuristic relation uh, has to hold for an epsilon that uh, should be set small. Uh, however, uh, when we consider the directly follow graph generated by split manner 2.0, uh, since it's much simpler and it doesn't have uh, a directly follow uh, relation between activities that are concurrent, uh, for the way we define the directly follow relation, um, when we want to check if two activities are concurrent, we just apply a uh, uh, simple uh, relations that is based on the observation of uh, overlapping activities uh, over the sum of the observation of each of the two activities. And now, uh, in this case, if we set uh, epsilon equal to one, uh, we would obtain a notion of uh, concurrency that is equivalent to the strong simultaneousness proposed by uh, Van der Werth. Uh, otherwise, for epsilon mm, mm, less than one, uh, we will consider uh, a notion of concurrency that is equivalent to weak simultaneousness. Um, so how does it work here? We have an example. Um, in this case, we have uh, six different uh, uh, instances of A and B, and four of them overlap. So basically applying this formula, we will get the ratio of 266, and uh, for uh, epsilon uh, small, this will be considered a uh, uh, concurrency between A and B. Now we move to the heuristics uh, um, additions. So first of all, very simple heuristics to remove uh, uh, certain uh, uh, improper completion uh, uh, constructs in the process models. So basically, whenever we have a structure of the type that you see here on the left, where we have a loop, uh, coming out from an end gateway, this will generate an improper completion in the execution of the process model. So to remove this, uh, we just uh, bring forward the loop, and uh, in this case, uh, we turn the process model sound. 
while uh, uh, regarding identification of our splits, uh, it's a bit different. So we start uh, from considering uh, a certain set of activities that are beyond the NAND gap. In this case, we have three activities, B, C, and D. And we have also an, um, an event load. Now, uh, for each pair of activity, uh, we consider how many times we observe the pair in, uh, with the overlapping life cycles. In this case, we would have D and C three times, B and D four times, and C and D five times. And how many times you observe each pair with uh, mutually exclusive. So we observe one activity, but we don't observe the other. In this case, we have D and C three times, uh, B and D two times, and C and D one time. Then, uh, for each of these uh, pair, we calculate the ratio of observation of mutually exclusive observation and concurrent uh, observation. So with overlapping uh, life cycles. So if you consider B and C, here we have a ratio of one to one. Uh, B and D, we have a ratio of one to two, and C and D, we have a ratio of one to five. Now, whenever this ratio is uh, um, equal or above uh, 0 0.5, we assume that between the two uh, uh, activities, uh, there is a no relation. And if uh, uh, more than, uh, uh, if the majority of the activities um, respect this or relation, we assume that there is no relation among uh, all the activities beyond the end um, gateway, and we turn the end gateway into a no gateway. Um, so um, we uh, evaluated uh, this extension of split minor. Um, we consider 11 um, private logs and one artificial log, so very simple. Uh, it's well known in our community, the repair example. And then uh, under the suggestion of the, uh, one of the reviewers, we also included the, the BPI challenge 12 and the BPI challenge 17 logs. Well, uh, for the baselines, uh, at the beginning, we consider only inductive mile life cycles, uh, plus uh, it's a frequent behavior filter and split mile. But uh, again, under the suggestion of the reviewer, we included uh, a recent version of inductive mile that is the all operators version. Now, a posteriori, uh, both for a matter of space uh, and um, for uh, reasons that we specify in the paper, we excluded the, the BPI challenge logs and inductive mile operators. So BPI challenge logs, we excluded them because for the BPI challenge 12, there were no overlapping life cycles. Uh, that means uh, and, um, the majority of the activity didn't have both start and end complete events. But for the BPI challenge 17 log, uh, both split mile and split mile 2.0 discovered the same model which was already analyzed in several previous studies. Um, why we removed the, the latest version of the mile? Because uh, most of the times we obtain either the same results of the mile life cycle or worse results, uh, except for one single log. Um, if we have a look at the results now, now, we can see that uh, considering fitness, uh, of course, pit minor, uh, inductive minor uh, outperforms pit minor because it's designed to maximize fitness. So we can see here the blue bars uh, most of the times outperform the others. Um, and um, we can also see that uh, split minor is missing for some logs. Uh, here is missing because it produces unsound model. Well, we can see that split minor 2.0 was able to discover always some models across uh, the all that. Regarding precision of score, split minor performs uh, better than in that minor, and uh, split minor and split minor 2.0 um, yield more or less similar results, uh, either equal or uh, um, better for the case of split minor 2.0, both in terms of precision and F score. Um, while well, if we focus on the complexity of the models uh, discovered, um, split minor 2.0 was able to discover simpler models. This because uh, uh, the directive for graph discovered by split minor 2.0 is usually much simpler than the one discovered by split minor. Um, while regarding structuredness, again, in that minor uh, um, outperforms a bit minor because by design it discovered block structured models. 
Now, uh, to conclude with the, some limitation and the future work, uh, first of all, this extension was uh, an heuristics-based extension. So one has to take it uh, for, uh, for what it is. Um, and again, we don't um, guarantee uh, soundness for the model discovered, although already Spitzmiller, uh, the original version, uh, um, was extremely reliable for discovering sound models. And with Spitzmiller 2.0, this reliability just increased. Finally, uh, we didn't find the fitness and precision measurement that would take into account activity life cycle. So what we did, uh, we simply stripped off the start events from the event log, and we used uh, well-known fitness and precision measurements uh, to assess uh, uh, the results. Regarding the future work, uh, uh, we think that there is still a lot of room for uh, discovery algorithm to um, exploit more information of the one that is recorded in the event log to uh, enhance the models discovered starting with the life cycle of the activities, but also other attributes. Um, there is still no discovery argument that guarantees soundness without enforcing block structureness. So this is another possible avenue for future work. And finally, uh, there could be the chance to design a fitness and precision measure that would take into, into account activity life cycle. So with this, I conclude. Uh, thank you for uh, attending. And now, if you have questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Ariano. So the floor is open for questions. I've learned I also have to monitor the chat on the Hoover site. Oh, then uh, let me let me start. Um, uh, I like it a lot. Um, uh, it's very nice to to kind of see the improvements there to to get more models uh, sound. Um, um, maybe you can say something about how many how many ore joints you actually discovered, right? So I mean, uh, uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, the benefits is that now you can kind of discover uh, ore splits and joints in a more reliable yes, way. And, uh, this can you say something that, about that one first? Yes, yeah, so another reason also why we use these private logs because uh, these logs come from consultancies that we did and um, this uh, paper is actually a result of some feedback that we got from uh, industry. Basically, there were a couple of these logs where uh, we were sure, well, the, the the clients were sure that there was an uh, inclusive choice uh, uh, relation between some activities, but uh, none of uh, the algorithms would, was able to discover this inclusive choice. And uh, for both of these logs, uh, we were able to discover them with uh, um, split mine 2.0, but we weren't for uh, by using uh, uh, split mine. Um, yeah, so. In uh, split mine 2.0, was able to discover uh, eight times uh, uh, end gateways and two times uh, or gateways in the models, while split mine will just discover XOR relations, so XOR gateways. So we think this is quite a nice addition to split mine. Although we believe that this was facilitated uh, by the additional information containing the log uh, that relates to the event life cycles, so the activity life cycle. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 nice. One follow-up question, though. I mean, um, the example you showed, there were block structured models, right? But I mean, split miner is good in. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. This models. is just uh, it just for a method. Yeah, of course, for for, for for clarity. So when you discovered or splits and joints, did you find them in blocks or were they no, actually no, no. that they were no, they were so really? Uh, the so basically, uh, the thing is, split miner discovered. Uh, a semi-block structured models because uh, whenever we have split uh, by design, a split might discover uh, block structured splits, but then the join is never block structured. So what happens is that uh, what I discussed now still holds because we have an end always and we have a certain number of activities beyond the end. And here we decide whether to put a no split uh, or keep the end. And then what happens is that uh, split miner by design starts putting all joints 
So what we do is that uh, we recursively remove your joints if uh, uh, by replaying the model with the token game, we identify that that's uh, a norm or yeah. otherwise we put an end on it, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I get how the, how the algorithm works. My, my, my question comes from the angle of, did we actually find models where, well, or splits and joints were not like paired in a block because when we, when we teach modeling, we always say, look, or, or, or join is always very dangerous. So when you do it, do it in blocks, right? So and I'm curious to know whether actually in real processes, you actually see something different. Yeah, so basically the, what you, what's implemented within Split Manner, we didn't design it from scratch, but we reused the definition of Hagen and Volzer that yeah. uh, allows us to identify whether a join is a NOR or can be turned into a, an end or an XOR split. Yeah. So we simply reuse a past uh, uh, research study finding to facilitate uh, the identification of all joints or uh, uh, end or XOR joints. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, are there more questions? We do have time in this session for more questions. Okay, so Marcello writes in the chat, that's nice to know that uh, uh, in the sepsis log, there's a nice or join in a non-block structure. Well, that's, uh, that's good to know. Um, everybody was interested, right? You know, the split miner 2.0, it's available to download. So everybody can try this out and have a look at it. We'll definitely do this afterwards. Um, there are no more questions. Um, then uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Adriano, uh, very much for this nice presentation and uh, time for a round of virtual applause. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, uh, we're now moving to the second presentation and maybe then afterwards we have some more discussion about uh, process discovery. That's by uh, Young Lu. Thank you very much, Dirk. Um, so you're also based in Australia at the moment, I understand, is that correct? Yeah, uh, we're from the University of Sydney. So that's now Melbourne versus Sydney in this session. Um, and you've been working on an extension of the inductive minor, which I personally yes. find very interesting. Um, and uh, you've been working on discovering non-block structured models with the inductive minor. So um, we're, very, we're very curious to hear what you found. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so hello everyone. So my name is Yang Lu. Um, I'm from the University of Sydney and currently I'm the uh, first year PhD student from the University of Sydney. Today I'm going to present the paper, a novel approach to discover uh, switch behaviors in process mining. So when talking about switch behavior, we mean the ability to switch ex exclusion rights between the different branches, um, between different ex ex exclusive choice branches. So for example, in the first process model here, uh, we will have a chance to switch to another exclusive choice branch after uh, the execution of activity A. And also in the second model here, so we first get a chance to switch to another, to another exclusive choice branch after the execution of activity A. And we also get a chance to switch back to the previous branch after the execution of activity E. So uh, what we have found is so basically, this is a sound pattern net model, which allows the switch of execution rights between the two exclusive choice branches. It can produce three traces, so which are A, B, C, D, E, F, and A, F. So this is a pretty simple one. However, so if we bring this event log directly into the inductive minor, uh, because of the directly follow relation from activity A to activity F, so um, we will no longer be able to find a proper card directly and the fall through will return. So as a result, we will get a flower model, which is sound, but with a very low precision. 
the inductive miners are very good for discovering sound process models, but it, they can return flower models when the behaviors are complex. We have found some previous work which uh, aims at improving the precision of inductive miners. For example, we can remove the infrequent relationships, um, uh, infrequent directly follow relationships, or to duplicate the activities with the same label but different behaviors. This approach can all can all um, reduce the chance of a fall through and increase the chance for finding a proper cut to avoid flower models. And some researchers also try to duplicate the loop number of loop structures to avoid arbitrary number of repeats of the um, loop structures. So the goal of our research is to allow, allow the inductive miner to capture the switch behaviors. So for the, uh, the ability to switch between different exclusive choice branches. Also, we want to, uh, because the inductive miner guarantees to return sound process models, so we also want our algorithm to be able to always discover sound and precise process models when switch behavior exists. And finally, we also want to reduce the chance of uh, returning flower models for inductive miners. So we have found that if we want to model the switch of execution rights between different exclusive choice branches using the patronet, we will always need a hidden transition. However, the patronets allowing the switch behaviors will no longer be block structured. So as a result, they cannot be discovered by the original inductive miners directly. And uh, usually a, a flower model will return if the, the switch behaviors exist in the patronets. And another interesting point we have found is that uh, if we get a block structure patronet, which is sound, and we try to add a hidden transition between the different exclusive choice branches, um, as long as we, we are not switching out of or into a parallel branch, so the soundness of the patronet can be maintained. But because the inductive miner uh, always produces some uh, process trees directly, they are actually limited to block structure process models. So in order to capture the switch behaviors, we have to define an extension to the process tree first. So the we call this extension uh, the a switch process tree. So first, um, it is the extension of the original process tree in order to support the switch behaviors. And also, uh, so it is basically a normal process tree uh, plus a switch leaf operator. So the switch leaf operator will define the source activity of the switch behavior and the destination activity of the switch behavior. And so when, if we combine the switch uh, leaf operator with the exclusive choice operator, we will be able to model the ability, the switch behavior between different exclusive choice branches. So here we show an example translation between the switch process tree to a uh, patronet. But in order to make sure so the process model is still sound, we don't want to allow the, any switch out of or into a parallel branch. For example, so in this switch process tree, we have a switch behavior from activity B to activity F, but because activity F is inside a parallel branch, so we will actually have a deadlock here. So we don't want this kind of uh, switch behavior to exist. Uh, the translation between the switch process tree and patchlet is very straightforward. So basically, we first ignore the switch behaviors and get a block structure sound patchnet first. And then for each of the switch behavior, we use an invisible task to connect its source and destination activity. But we get two special cases. So the first, the first one is, uh, so if the source activity is the end activity of an exclusive choice branch, or when the destination activity is the start activity of an ex exclusive choice branch, we need to use extra invisible tasks to model this behavior. So for example, in the second process tree, we want to model the switch from activity C to activity D. The activity C is in the end of our exclusive choice branch and activity B, uh, D is at the beginning of another exclusive choice branch. So in order to um, represent this behavior accurately in a patronet, we add two more invisible tasks to represent this switch behavior. Another um, 
Another case is when the source of a switch behavior is a point for end split, or if the destination of the switch behavior is a end join. Um, we need, if we want to make sure the model is sound, we also need to add extra invisible tasks to act as the start point for the parallel or end point for the parallel. So for example here, if we want to have a switch behavior from activity A to activity E, because activity A is exactly before the parallel uh, sub-process tree, so we need to add an extra invisible task here to act as the start point for these parallel branches in order to make sure it's sound. So in order to discover the switch process tree, we first use a theory from a previous study, which is actually the alpha hash algorithm. So in this paper, they propose a theory. So for a subset of workflow nets, if this following condition is satisfied, then there will be a possible invisible task between the activity A and activity B. So a very interesting point of this um, theory is we will be able to identify the possible invisible tasks uh, in the process before the process discovery stage. So we can know um, if there are possible invisible tasks between each pair of activity um, by simply looking at the event log. And based on our observation, we find that if the invisible task is between the two exclusive choice branches, then a switch behavior can be detected. So our idea is if the exclusive choice cut of the original inductive minor, if it, if it can cut an invisible task, then we will be able to find a switch behavior. So we want to relax the condition of the exclusive choice cut in the original inductive minor. So every time before we want to find if there is an exclusive choice cut or not in the inductive minor, we go through the event log first and use the theory from the previous study to identify if there are possible invisible tasks between any activities. So, and then in the directly, directly follow graph of the inductive minor, if we know there is an invisible task between any two activities, we will change the edge uh, between the two activities into an invisible edge defined by us, and we will allow the exclusive choice cut to cut through the invisible edges. So every time, um, so this is pretty straightforward now. So every time if the exclusive choice cut of the original inductive minor cuts through an invisible edge, then we will be able to find a switch behavior on the operator. But a problem with this uh, approach is that um, because the inductive minor is a divide and conquer approach, so when we are, when we are doing the exclusive choice cut, we have no knowledge about um, what what the children of the exclusive choice operators are. So we cannot make sure the switch behaviors we find uh, will not make the process model unsound. So what we do is we uh, double check this sw switch process tree in the end and go through each operator and see if, um, if there, there are any switch behaviors which will violate our restriction. So for example, if we get a switch behavior from activity B to F, because it will cause a potential deadlock, so we, we will delete this switch behavior in the end. Um, this approach can make sure the process model is still sound, but it can reduce the fitness if we remove uh, too many important switch behaviors. Also, uh, because in the original inductive minor framework, so we not only need to split the directly follow graph uh, recursively, we also need to switch the, uh, to split the event log uh, recursively as well. So a uh, potential problem here is, for example, if we get three traces, A, B, C, D, E, F, and A, B, E, F here, um, we can, if we can identify there is a switch behavior between activity B and activity E, but at the point when we are splitting the event log, uh, the trace A, B, E, F will actually be splitted into A, B. So this will cause uh, unnecessary escape behavior here. Um, uh, a solution to this is every time we detect if there is a switch behavior inside a trace, we can try to delete this, uh, delete the trace with the switch behavior. But the problem is if we do this, it will have a higher requirement of the complete list of the log. 
So we first try to use some simple event log, event data to evaluate our algorithm. So for each of these event logs, if we apply the original inductive miners, um, basically we will get uh, a flower model with low precision. And after using our extension, we can capture these switch behaviors more accurately. And also um, there is a potential limitation is when we have uh, we will have consecutive uh, switch behaviors. If the invisible tasks are connecting to the same place, uh, it will naturally cause a uh, skip behavior here, but because the inductive miner can capture the skip behavior itself, so actually they will, it will cause one more unnecessary um, invisible task in the process model. Uh, we also try to use the real uh, life even data to evaluate this algorithm. So we use the BPIC13 incident data and we use the event lamp plus the life cycle as the activity classifier. Um, we find that uh, we compare the algorithm with the inductive minor infrequent and the split minor. We find that all three methods can produce a model with high fitness. However, the induct inductive minor infrequent will return a model with low precision. Our approach uh, raises the precision of the inductive minor infrequent successfully in this case. And in addition, our approach can also return a model with both higher precision F score than the split minor for this data set. Uh, for the model complexity, our approach can also achieve a uh, smaller size and CFC than the split minor for the BPIC 13 incident. Uh, finally, we also provide a visualization of the process model we discovered. So uh, for in the first graph is the process model discovered by the inductive minor infrequent directly. So as we can see, so there is a local flower model in the middle. So uh, which will cause the precision of the uh, process model to be low. Um, after we uh, use the extension to the inductive minor, we successfully decompose this local flower model um, into a more precise one. So we get, uh, we improve the precision from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Young. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Are there questions? Arik is clapping, I'll also clap. I, I have a question if, if there are no other questions. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of hands raised. So, oh, sorry, uh, I didn't see that. So we have uh, Mohamed Reza, uh, you're first. So uh, thanks for your presentation, it's very nice. Uh, I'm wondering how, how your method is sensitive to noise. Uh, so currently in our evaluation, we combine this approach with the inductive minor infrequent and set the threshold to 0 0.2. Yeah, I mean, for example, suppose that you use inductive minor 0.2, and for example, you apply it on uh, on an event log with lots of noise in it. For example, I don't know, BPI challenge 2012, something like that. Have you ever applied on a bigger log? Uh, so we are trying to do more experiment at this stage, but now uh, the data we get is still limited. But the I think the sensitivity of the noise is very dependent on the sensitivity of to noise of the inductive minor infrequent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's an interesting topic. We can maybe discuss later further. Mitchell uh, is the next one with a question. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, thank you. I, I actually have a comment on Mohamed Reza's uh, comment uh, as well, um, because I, I know for for a fact that the BPI's uh, 2012 log probably doesn't show um, switching behavior. I, I've, I've studied this log quite a bit. Um, anyway, my question is: um, you you defined a new operator for the for a process tree. Yes. Um, and uh, I know the inductive miner does not produce label duplication, but a process tree does not exclude label duplication. Yeah. Do you think you can make your operator deal with label duplication or is that out of the question? Would you just have to relabel things? 
Uh, so what I'm thinking about, because currently there is no relabeling of the activities, but I'm thinking about, because uh, in order to make sure the model is still sound, we actually delete this uh, switch behaviors, which cannot satisfy our restriction. So what we do is, um, I'm thinking about if we can do some label duplication to uh, solve this problem, because if we delete this switch behaviors, we are also deleting some directly follow relations. So I'm thinking about if we can um, maintain the fitness of the process model um, by duplicating the event labels. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mitchell. Uh, Arik, you had a question. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, Mohammad Reza asked my question. All right. We're, we're good. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Young, I also have a question. So, um, of course, I like it that uh, that you extend the inductive minor framework because that's how we how we intended it to be, right? That you can build on it and extend it in various ways. One of the things that was always important to Sunder and to the inductive minor framework is to um, also reason a bit about, um, say, rediscoverability, right? So, so the ability to know you actually discovered the right thing. So. Um, um, did you do any investigation so far on, say, the ability to rediscover switching behavior on, well, the processes you're covering, right? So process trees with, with switching behavior in the X walk part. Did you do any analysis there? Uh, I think at this moment, it is still a little bit preliminary stage. Um, but I think we can try to find out the scope of the rediscoverability based on the, because we actually use the theory from the alpha hash algorithm. I think uh, based on that theory, we, we, sh we might be able to find, um, so under which case we can identify the invisible task success, successful, successfully or not. Yeah, I think I think looking there would be this is probably a good uh, point to get started. But I think it would be very interesting to know, right, uh, what uh, when things are preserved. Um, are there more questions from the audience? Maybe I have one. Uh, another one. Do you have also a picture of the model discovered by the split miner, right? So you compared the inductive miner and and your model, and of course the one with the switching behavior looks more complicated. Now, always personally, when when I look at evaluations of process discovery algorithms, uh, I think proof of the pudding is in eating, which is the model how it looks like. Um, so, do you happen to have the picture of the split minor model for the BK13 log available? Um, so, I think I don't have it right now, but so on the paper there is a link to a GitHub page. I have actually put that model on the GitHub public okay, page. Great, 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 great. That, uh, that's good to to look at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Derek, I may have another question. Yes, please. Um, yeah, th thank you for your presentation and, and for your work. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, you said we are just still doing experiments. Um, at this moment, you present the results, you compare it to, with, with uh, split mine also uh, on, on the BPI challenge. Have you extended experiments on other data sets and, and are they consistent with your results thus far? Uh, we have tried a bit more, so can I share my screen again? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, Yeah, so we have tried a bit more data sets, so including the BPI C2020 uh, and the road traffic management data set. And also for the BPI 13, we tried two different classifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, for this data set, it works well, I think, at, at least for the F score and precision side. Uh, but for, we, we have also noticed that for some other data sets, um, the result may not be that good currently. Yeah. Now, I, I think I, I think it would be um, not realistic to think that you can find a miner that outperforms every other miner on every other possible data set. Like you said, that's actually not possible at all. Um, so, uh, but it's good to see that the pattern that you have seen that reoccurs sometimes. I also wondered, are you planning on doing some, and maybe that relates 
I'm not sure if I understood the question of Derek correctly, but maybe too late, but on uh, testing out your algorithm on event logs where you actually know the underlying process of because you created that one so that you know, I mean, you could have an improvement in precision, but maybe it hasn't, doesn't, doesn't mean because of the switching behavior, maybe there's another reason why you improve precision. So that you can, because that's your claim, right? You get more precise models because you can actually identify switching behavior. Yeah. Are you planning on doing such kind of experiments on, 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 on artificial data where you know what's in the model to see if it actually, if you, that improvement of precision is actually contributable to the switching behavior? Yeah, well, I think about maybe we can, we, we will get into the health informatics uh, space and say if we can get some hospital data and find some real switch behavior. Yeah, but if I think we can get some process we know. Yeah, I, and I don't don't understand me wrong. I think ultimately we have to test these things on real life data. But if you, whenever you get an event log, you simply don't know what what's there in your underlying process. Yeah. yeah. So um, what you could consider as a complement to your current experiments and, and analysis is uh, there has been some work. Uh, for creating process trees, generating process trees, which you then use okay. to generate artificial event logs, and then start mm -hmm. from those event logs. I don't think that those artificial generators at this moment is able to incorporate switching behavior into these process trees. So, so you might have to change that. But at least then you know if you find an improvement in precision, and the only thing that changes the addition of switching behavior then that's really what you're picking up. Well, if you have a set of event logs coming from process models which don't contain switching behavior and you're improving precision, there's another thing that's happening there that you need to understand. Okay. So, so that, I mean, something you might have a look at. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Benoit. Definitely useful input. Um, there are no more questions for the official part of the session. Then uh, we end this session on process discovery. Thank you again, uh, Adriano and uh, Jan, for presenting uh, these recent progresses. Uh, we now have about uh, 22 minutes of break. So we continue uh, quarter to the hour because everybody's in different time zone and don't say the full hour, quarter to the hour, continue with the third session. The session stays open, so if you want to hang around during the break and have another chat with the authors or with us, uh, free for you to do so. Um, thank you again. <laughs>